Okay, so in this problem, we're going to look at uh, a seemingly, at first glance, easier problem than what we've been, been dealing with, but we have a lot to talk about in this one. So for this problem, we're looking at the free particle. So the potential is just going to be zero everywhere. So there's no well, meaning there are, can't be any bound states, because if there's no well, then how can you have any bound states? And what this means is our Hamiltonian will just become, uh, it will just have this kinetic energy term. So it's just proportional to uh, the momentum operator squared. And what that means is that our energy eigenstates will also be eigenstates of momentum. So, and that'll be important later on. So our equation, our eigenvector equation will become this thing. And it's just the usual equation that we've been dealing with. And this time, I'm going to choose these complex exponentials as solutions. And here, um, so something different happens from what we've been dealing with before. So um, we don't have any boundary conditions that we can apply to really simplify this. And even our, our the usual boundary condition that the wave function should vanish at minus infinity and infinity doesn't really work anymore because both of these functions are just squiggly, you know, they, they oscillate, they don't, there's no way to make them decay at minus infinity or plus infinity. So we can't really do anything with these. And actually these states, uh, we, we say they aren't physically realizable states because there's no way to have any kind of probabilistic interpretation of the wave function if you're in this kind of state. And uh, normally what's done is, uh, so although you can't have, you know, this as a good eigenstate, you can still build, uh, you know, your wave function out as a linear combination of these states, because this is, you know, it's a basis. So I, sh I should still be able to write my wave function as a linear combination of these uh, eigenstates. And... <clears throat> So rather than writing this, you could just take this as your solution and just let k either be positive or negative. And then obviously, any solution you could build out of these functions, you could build out of just these if you allow k to be negative. And then another quick thing to note is, um, so these are, you know, the eigenvectors. And notice, we, have, we don't have any restriction on the value of k, so k can just be anything. And as we can see from this equation, our energy is just h bar squared k squared over 2m. And from our Hamiltonian, that's just p squared over 2m. So it's clear that our momentum is just h bar k. So uh, the momentum can take any value. So I'll use kind of k and momentum interchangeably because they're just related by this constant h bar. So uh, k can be anything, it can be any positive or negative value, and it can take on a continuum of values, just like position. So what that means is when we're building our wave function out of these states, we have to use an integral. So it's conceptually, the, again, the same thing we've been doing before. We want to build our, you know, our initial wave function out of these eigenstates, and because k, uh, there, there's an eigenvalue for every there's a continuum of eigenvalues for all k, I have to use this integral to write my linear superposition. And instead of having just expansion coefficients, I need a function of k because, again, it's uh, I have an expansion coefficient for every continuous value of k. And But still, if you do this, since our Hamiltonian is you know, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian or eigenstates of the momentum operator. Um, once you've done this, you can trivially solve the Schrodinger equation just by applying the time evolution operator. So every term in your sum, or in your integral in this case, just gets a factor of e to the minus i e k t over h bar, where e k is again this thing. And if you do that, then your problem is solved, trivially, because you've, this, this is it. This is size as a function of uh, time. So, and again, it's an integral form, but presumably you can do the integral. And so once again, the problem that you usually deal with is not that you can't do this, it's that 
you normally don't have this expansion in terms of the right basis. Normally you just have this function of x, your initial wave function, but you don't know how to expand it in terms of the momentum eigenstates. And by looking at this equation, in this case, we see, um, hopefully you recognize, that we can get these expansion coefficients by taking the Fourier transform of psi of x. So this is clearly the, I've written this specifically so that it's a, a, the inverse Fourier transform. So we have this equation for f k if we have this equation for psi of x. So basically what that means is what we have to do is we start out with our initial wave function. We take the Fourier transform and that will give us these coefficients. So it'll tell us basically how to expand our wave function in terms of these momentum eigenstates. And then once we've done that, we can just use this equation to trivially solve the Schrodinger equation by applying the time evolution operator. So we start here, use this equation to get f of k, then plug that in here, and we have psi of x and t. And I think it's worth at this point to kind of look at how we end up with a Fourier transform in this case and see how it relates to what we've been doing and show how it's really not um, anything different from what we've encountered before. So what we can do is compare these two problems that we've looked at. So the first problem is the uh, magnetic field in the x direction. And this problem, we obviously have this free particle. And the problem we have in each of these uh, problems is the same. It's that normally we have our wave function expanded in terms of a basis that is not the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian. So in this case, we normally expanded the wave function in terms of, or the wave vector in terms of the spin z eigenkets. And here we normally expand the wave function in terms of the position eigenkets. And we have these two representations depending on the problem. Um, and so what we want to do, what we know we can do, is that we can write our wave function instead, since you know uh, these are we have um, these operators. We should be able to form a basis of these operators, so a basis for our uh, the eigen eigen basis of the Hamiltonian, basically. So we should be able to expand our wave function in terms of these spin x eigenkets for this problem. And in this problem, we know that we should be able to expand our wave function in terms of these uh, momentum eigenkets. And again, we want to do that because if we can do that, then we can trivially solve the Schrodinger equation by applying the time evolution operator. And the problem became, okay, how do we, given these things, given these representations, how do we find these representations? And so what we had to do was for, in this case, is you know, solve the eigenvector problem, which can be uh, reduced to essentially this matrix equation. So if you basically, uh, what I do here is I, you can set these two equations equal to each other because I just expanded psi in two different bases and then just uh, multiply on the left by sx plus or sx minus. And so you'll get two different equations which be, can be cast in terms of this matrix equation. And so the point is that I can relate my two representations in these two bases by this matrix equation. So I have my representation, the C vector, which is my representation in the uh, SZ basis. And using this matrix, which is called the, I guess it, you'd call it the um, basis transformation matrix, is you transform to a representation in the SX basis. So, um, Yes, yeah, so we have that. And then uh, if you're familiar with index notation, you can write this using this uh, summing form. So the ith component of this vector is given by this thing. And by comparing, and hopefully you just know this from some math method cl class you've taken. But the point is, by looking at this formula, you can see how we get to the Fourier transform because it's really the same thing. Here we have, it's a, it's a they're both basis transformations. So here I have, this, these vectors that I'm relating. And of course, for a continuous basis, these vectors will become functions of k and x, respectively, rather than just having labels for the different uh, you know, eigenvalues. And similarly, rather than having this matrix uh, with labels i and j, 
This becomes a function of two variables, k and x in this case, and instead of a sum, I have an integral. So you can see how this becomes this equation, well, besides this factor of 1 over square root of 2 pi, which is just there for, I guess, convenience, but just so it looks like a Fourier transform that we're used to dealing with. But it's conceptually the same kind of thing. We're just getting one representation uh, from the other. And um, so that's mathematically what's going on. There's some physical stuff to say about this as well. Uh, so we saw before that our uh, the whole reason we're having to deal with these basis transformations is that these operators, my Sx and Sz operator, they didn't commute. So their com this commutation relation, it's, again, it's not important so much right now that we get and something that's proportional to sy, the important thing is that they don't commute, so this isn't zero. And what that means is we can't have states of definite sx and sz. So um, when we write our sx, one of our, you know, for example, the sx plus basis vector, that ends up being a linear combination of my sz basis vectors. And what that means physically is if I'm in a state of definite, you know, spin up in the x direction, that is the same as a linear combination of spin up and spin down in the z direction. So the reason you can't have states of definite sx and sz is because if you're in a state of definite S sx, you're also in a state that is not a definite state of sz. These are mathematically and physically equivalent states. And we can do a similar kind of thing. So uh, in this case, the position and momentum operators, similarly, similarly, they don't commute. So we'll have a similar kind of thing happening. So if I write this uh, in terms of the representation, so this statement is just, you know, when I represent it in terms of my uh, column vectors, it looks like this, but it means the same kind of thing. And we can uh, make form a similar kind of equation for our uh, continuous system. So if we, our, our position eigenkets are going to be represented by Dirac delta functions, which should make sense because if you were, if we're a position eigenket means the particle is definitely at a certain position, which means the wave function must just be a spike at that position. So it makes sense that we have a delta function for our representation. And then what we can do is we can, if we have this as our wave function, what we can do is find the momentum representation from this formula. So we can just plug in delta of uh, x, or well, x minus x prime, I think I did, uh, into here. And then because we have a delta function, we can trivially do this integral to find f of k. So we can find our momentum representation. And um, we get this. It's a trivial integral to do. And then we can go back, and we know that we can write our uh, wave function like this, we can exp we should be able to expand our delta function in terms of these momentum eigenstates. And so I just plug in f of k here. And as you can see, this, so this equation here is the, again, kind of a continuous analog of this equation. So we have this representation, or well, really, yeah, so we have this representation, and we've written it as a linear combination of this of these other basis vectors, so what? Um, so we have a similar kind of thing happening here. If we're in a state of definite position, that is the same as a linear combination of momentum eigenstates. So that's the reason you can't be in a state of definite momentum and position is because, just like for my spin spin system. If you're in a state of definite position, you are simultaneously in a state that is a state that is not a definite, that uh, doesn't have definite momentum. It's a linear combination, in fact, an infinite linear combination of these momentum eigenkets. So it has, you know, all values of the other, uh, you know, all possible values of momentum. So it's, it's even, it's really bad. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to uh, kind of, I, I guess the goal was to uh, show how, even though things look different when we're dealing with these continuous bases, 
it's really all the same. And the only complication arises in that we're dealing with more complex mathematical objects, but conceptually it's just, it's nothing new that we've been doing.